Good morning, colleagues. Thank you to the choir for the beautiful rendition of music this morning. Everybody say amen. That's what I heard, at least the second song. That was beautiful. Let's consider a text together. Uh, 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9. 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9. And it reads as follows. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, so that we through his poverty might become rich. What a beautiful text. Amen. The city of Corinth was thriving in many ways. Thriving economically, culturally, socially, educationally, and some extent, and religiously as well. Economically, Corinth boasted of uh, two ports, which was unusual in those days. And so there was booming business flowing from Italy and Spain in the West and Asia Minor. Also, business came from Phoenicia and Egypt in the East. So two ports. So the city called Corinth was rich and blessed. Culturally and educationally, uh, Corinth was a typical Greek, Greek culture environment. Now those of you who know those days, when you were a Greek, you spent more time, you know, philosophizing than doing anything. They loved wisdom. They would wake up in the morning, those who, were, who loved philosophy, to go to the marketplaces and they would spend the whole day philosophizing. When you were asked, why, where are you going? You said to your family, I'm going down the market. What are you going to do today? I'm just going to philosophize. So culturally, educationally, and economically, Corinth was, was great. Religiously as well, boasted of 12 magnificent temples in the city. And they had many array of gods in the temple, almost a god for anything that you could find in Corinth. But one of the most important goddesses that they had was Aphrodite, the goddess of love. And they, were, they had over 1,000 sacred priestesses of love and prostitutes were many in Corinth. So famous was prostitution in Corinth that uh, you would find people, they, they coined a special term and they would say, let's go and Corinthianize, meaning let's go and uh, do some prostituting around Corinth. So there was a goddess of healing as well, and because of that, they, they were, this was a center for open and unbridled morality. Now the city itself but, and the church was influenced by the city in one way or the, or the other. We know from reading First and Second Corinthians that Paul addressed many issues in Corinth, and some of those issues that he addressed were the erroneous teachings and theories, strange theories that were in Corinth. We know, we know that he addressed divisions in Corinth. We know that he spoke about uh, the effect of litigation in pagan courts. We know that he spoke about boasting, people boasting about the supremacy of their knowledge and wisdom in Corinth. But we also know from, from the scriptures that uh, in Corinth there were ecstatically gifted women <coughs> who clamored for freedom and would shout, shout and disturb worship, shouting from the back of the church where they were, telling their husbands that we don't want this hair covering anymore. We also know that from text that uh, uh, there were officials, individuals in Corinth, those who were eager to give advice all the time, who were swelled with the sense of their own importance and knowledge and had wounded many consciences uh, in Corinth. And my dear friends, this morning, our text says, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though uh, he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, that we through his poverty might be rich. Something interesting here, just a, as a little background again of what Paul is mentioning here. Paul is of course motivating the Corinthians by making reference to their old rivalry and competitor, Greece and Macedonia. These were long rivalries 
Interesting that these were called barbaric by, Corinthi by Corinthians. The churches of Greece and Macedonia were experiencing the most severe trial in, in their lives. But Paul showcases the gener generous spirit of Macedonians and in a comparative manner to that of, uh, of, of the Corinthians. Paul here is very proud of the Macedonians because they are able to give more and not worthy is the fact that Macedonians are giving during their worst time in the midst of trials and yet they are able to exceed you know in terms of giving the Macedonian church are a testimony that it is possible not merely to experience joy but to have it overflow in the midst of trial but even more my dear friends just as persecution did not take away their joyfulness, neither did poverty diminish their ability to be generous. They were gracious for the grace that, Lord, that the Lord extended to them. Verse 3 of 2 Corinthians it tells us that they gave beyond expectation and yet according to their ability. They were not asked to give, uh, but they did so out of their own volition, even persuaded Paul to accept their gifts. The cherry on top for me and perhaps the finest and commendable thing that they did, according to verse 5 now, was the fact that they first gave themselves to the Lord and then, and then, and, and then to Paul. They gave themselves, they gave their lives to God first and then they were able to give their offering. They gave and served the best to Christ first. And this is where Paul makes a comparison between them and the Corinthians. Their poor economic status at that particular time did not deter them from participating fully in God's service. They were sincere about their Christian calling, although it was still in its infancy. It was not just monetary, but a heart obligation as well. Now between chapters 8 and 9, just those two, two chapters, there are 10 words that uh, ten uh, carries words on grace that Apostle Paul uses there, just in two chapters. But the one I want to focus on today, my dear friends, this morning, is the divine favor, the divine grace that Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9. Listen to this one, my dear friends. You know, Paul says here, Corinthians, for you know, he simply says, this is so obvious. This you should know already. This is common knowledge. I'm surprised that you even doubt this grace. Isn't it obvious, Corinthians? This you should have known long time already that the grace of God has been extended to you. It has been extended, bestowed, and given, and lavishly poured upon you. Here's a man who knew what grace was. He was on his way to Damascus. He was given that grace himself. So when Paul spoke about grace, he knew what he was talking about. And when he received that grace, he never looked back again. He says, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Can I remind you, my dear friends, this morning, that this grace is sufficient. That this grace is called the marvelous grace. That this grace makes us whole and holy. That this grace, <clears throat> it is infinite. That this grace, my dear friends, it is, it is free but not cheap because it costs ev heaven everything. That this grace, my dear friends, knows no bounds. That this grace endures <clears throat> forever, sorry. That this grace, my dear friends, comes to us as a virtue from God unmerited and undeserved. That this grace, my dear friends, it is still God's riches at Christ's expense even today. It is a grace that restores lost dignities. It is a grace that gives us the voice again when we have lost it. The grace that forgives our past, our present, and our future. This grace, my dear friends, it clears our soiled past. This grace helps us to face our failures and our shame without losing our composure and our compactness. This grace, my dear friends, always amazes, but never disgraces anyone. Listen to this, my dear friends. This grace is so simple, it is yet amazing. This grace is so much attacked, but yet undefeated. This grace is mostly imprisoned, yet remains unchained. 
This grace is mostly bad, yet remains unstoppable. Mostly debated, yet undisputed. Mostly written about, yet uh, 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 no greater pen can be able to put it together. Displayed on Calvary's tree over 2,000 years ago, and yet still remains relevant and powerful even today. This grace is tapped into every day and yet still remains sufficient. And some, uh, uh, some lepers were singing in Liberia. They were singing this beautiful song. Though millions have come, yet there's still room for one. Yes, there's room for you at the cross because of this grace. It challenges yet remains unchallenged. It is timeless and yet it always remains on time. It engulfs all people and yet still remains intact. In, uh, intact. It cleanses all, yet remains pure. It is undeserved and yet remains unveiled. I can talk the whole day about this wonderful grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though grace, uh, through grace, our potential is always superior to our credentials. This grace is always superior to our grade. This grace is always more powerful than any of our merit that we have. This grace, my dear friends, it, you can be stripped of everything else, but only make sure that you keep this grace. It is a grace that impacts our growth, our stability and in our Christian life. Grace that has awakened in us the sense and the reality of a loving God. And no, my dear friends, the difference between the lost sinners and the saved sinners is the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Grace that ushers us into eternal life. Listen to this one, my dear friends. A man in Chicago whose shop was destroyed by fire and did not have anything left, everything destroyed. The next morning he woke up and he put a sign among the debris and then he said, all lost except wife, children, and hope and grace. And then he said, business will resume as usual. That's what this grace does, my dear friends. The grace that keeps us away from the second death. There is no other word amazing than amazing grace. There's no other explanation that will do but unmerited favor that is amazing grace. And then, my dear friends, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, let me quickly move into that quickly. Of course, the richness at this point refers to the antecedent riches before assumption of human nature, before condescension. Remember, my dear friends, this grace was given to us by Christ who was rich. Rich in what, my dear friends? He was rich from eternity to eternity. He is a person who communicated with the Father whenever and wherever he wanted. He was in perfect harmony with the Father and the universe. He possessed in himself all the fullness of the Godhead, receiving all the adoration of angels. He is a person who was eternal, infinite, and immutable, and he gave us this grace. He was before all things, and, 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 and who made all things, self-existent one, self-proclaimed, no beginning of days, not at the end of years. Immortal, invisible, and invincible. The person who sat on the throne and whose, uh, whose immensity cannot be measured. Omnipresent God, omniscience, omnipotence. He was rich, my dear friends. Amen. Yet, uh, he gave his life to us. Rich in, rich in rare wisdom, rich in honor. Myriads of angels bowing before him, worshipped by, by other worlds. Rich in creative power visible and invisible, spoke worlds into existence. He simply had to say, let there be and, and there would be. He, he just needed to speak one word and all things would, have, would happen. Rich in love, for his love is so deep, you can't go under it. Rich in love, his love is so wide, you can't get around it. Rich in love, and it's so high, you can't get over it. That's why it's an amazing grace. The extent and amount of his riches, therefore, is to be measured by the extent of the dominion over the universe. And to estimate his riches, therefore, we are to conceive 
of the scepter which he sways over the distant world. There's a beautiful song that I like so much. The wonder of it all. There is a wonder at sunset at evening. The wonder at sunrise I see. But the wonder of wonders that thrills my soul is the wonder that God loves me. Amen. Though he was rich, <clears throat> yet uh, for our sakes he became poor. How poor did he become, my dear friends? We learn, we learn from Philippians 2, 6 to 8, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon himself the form of a servant and was made unto the likeness of man. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became unto death, even the death of the cross. Now, if you, do, if you had to contrast that with uh, Isaiah 14, uh, 13 to 14 with Lucifer, Lucifer simply said, you know, instead of humbling himself, that I will exalt my throne above the stars. I will sit on the mountain far away in the north. I will sit above the clouds of God. I will be like God. What a contrast between Jesus and Lucifer. Uh, though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor. From the pen of inspiration, it is out of ages, page 22. This was a voluntary sacrifice. Jesus might have remained at the Father's side. He might have retained the glory of heaven and the homage of angels. But he chose to give back the scepter into the Father's hands and to step down from the throne of the universe that he might bring light to the benighted and life to the perishing. What kind of grace is this? How beautiful it is. How poor did he become, my dear friends? Listen to this one just for a minute. He allowed himself to be, un to be born unhonored, unheralded, and unrecognized. Born in an obscure village, chose the condition of poverty, never wrote a book, and yet today no famous author can boast of as many inspiration that he gives to those who write books about him. Never held an office or ran for political office, never owned a home, never built a mansion for himself, never did not allow himself to have all the comforts of a member of a family, never went to college or university, and yet today, my dear friend, there is no university that can boast of as many students as he has. And I can see some of you this morning allowed public opinion to turn against him, allowed himself to be nailed between two thieves, allowed his executioners to gamble with the piece of property uh, that he ever owned. He laid in a borrowed grave and, and made available by by a friend. He borrowed a boat from which to teach the people. He borrowed some fish and loaves to feed the people. He borrowed a coin with which to demonstrate God's claim over Caesar. He borrowed a room in which to eat the Lord's Supper and a donkey to which to ride to the final destiny, his final meal. His own assessment of his personal net worth simply reads, Foxes of holes and birds of air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He sometimes had to depend upon the charity of others for food, and yet he scatters the seeds and plants of the forest. You might have seen this in the spirit of prophecy. He had to ask for water, and yet he digs the springs of the ocean by assuming human nature with all its weaknesses and imperfections, accepting meanness, associating himself with bankrupts, bankrupts and beggars. He who was waited upon now becomes a servant. He who listened to the glorious hallelujahs is now spat upon. He allows himself to be beaten and whipped by the Roman soldiers. He goes through Gethsemane. His Calvary experience is, is horrific. He commanded uh, 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 his mother to the charitable attention of John. He made no will for he, for, for he at nine. When Christ took off the real rope, Ellen White says, stripping himself of the glory of heaven, angels were amazed. They came and wanted to give themselves, wanted to come and die for us. But uh, that wasn't uh, to be. My dear friends, the last part of it says, yet though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, that we through his poverty might be rich. Are we rich this morning, my dear friends? Let me share with you how rich you are in case you don't know. Here's a poem by Martha Snell Nicholson. I sinned, then straight, straight away, straight away, post haste, Satan flew before the presence of the Most High God and made a railing accusation. There he said, pointing at me, 
This soul, this cling of soul, of soul of clay has sinned and it must die. This is true that he has named your name, but I demand his death, the devil said. The soul that sinned shall die. Shall not your sentence be fulfilled, God? Is justice dead in heaven yet? And so he did accuse me day and night, and every word he spoke was true. Then listen to this one, my dear friend. Then quickly, hallelujah to this one. Then quickly, one rose from God's right hand, before whose glory angels veil their faces. He spoke, each jot of the law must be fulfilled. The guilty sinner, yes, must die. But wait, his guilt was all transferred to me, and I paid the penalty. Behold my side. Behold my feet. One day I was made sin for him and died that he might be presented guiltless, guiltless at the throne. Then Satan flew away, for he knew that he could not contend against such love. That's how rich you are, my dear friends. You have the Son of God, you know, who is uh, standing there to say, I have paid the price. We are rich in goodness and kindness because of him. You are rich in forbearance and tolerance and patience because of, because of him. You are rich in wisdom and knowledge and mercy and grace because of him. Yes, we are rich because we have been restored to a state of reconciliation with God. We have been given a robe of righteousness. He went to the lowest that we might be exalted to the throne. As I'm talking to you this morning, Apostle Paul in Ephesians says, we are sitting this morning with him in heavenly places. As we are sitting here right now, we are in heaven in him. In him we become more closely united to God as if we have never fallen before. What more riches do we want between Christ and us? Remember, there is a tie of love that can never be broken, saved by our choice. We are rich. We are, our faithfulness is in Christ. Our, we are chosen in Christ. We are adopted in Christ. We are accepted in Christ. We are redeemed in Christ. We are sealed in Christ. All over us is, re, is written in, blood, in red, in blood, saying, These are mine. They are, eternal, they are eternally mine. I remind you, my dear friends, in closing now, that uh, we have a son. And this son, a man of extraordinary independence, immense courage, and unparalleled authenticity. The son who was never afraid to differ radically from everybody else, past and present, in an age when group conformity was the only measure of truth and virtue. The son, we are reaching the son who was not impressed with the immense learning of the scribes who differed from them because with him no authority was too great to be contradicted and no assumption was too fundamental to be changed. The only man who ever lived with no traces of fear. He was not afraid of creating a scandal or losing a reputation for the sake of saving mankind. Disregarding the men of his days who were disturbed by the way he mixed socially with sinners, by the way he enjoyed the company of the nobodies and the, and the outcasts. That's the son that you and I have this morning. And then, last comparison now, Jesus and Alexander the Great. Remember those two, my dear friends? Both of them died at 33 years of age. One lived for, for, and died for self, and the other one died for you and me. What an amazing grace that was. <clears throat> the Greek died on the throne, trying to rule, but Jesus died on a cross trying to save you and I. That's amazing grace. One, Alexander the Great, it seemed as if his life was triumphant all the time. But the other one walked alone most of the time. One left vast armies to kill. The other one walked alone and prayed in Gethsemane most of his life. One shed the whole world's blood. The one that other one gave his own blood. One won the world in life and lost it all in death. The other one lost his life to win the whole world of faith. One died in Babylon. The other one died on Calvary. One gained all for self. And the other one himself he gave. One conquered every throne. The other one conquered every grave. What a wonderful grace we have. The other one is the one who made himself God. The other one is the God who made himself less. The other one lived but to blast all the time. The other one lived but to bless. When, when Alexander died, he forever lost his throne. But Jesus died to live forever. Lord of lords and king of kings. The Greek make all men slaves. Jesus made all men free. One built a throne on blood, 
the other one built a throne on love. One came, one came from, the, from earth, the other one came from, from heaven. And here's a beautiful one, my dear friends. Uh, the Greek forever died, Jesus forever lives even today. And he's still the incomparable Christ that we have. What a wonderful grace that we have this morning. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, that you and I, through his poverty, might be rich. May we accept this grace, and may we bless eternally. Amen. Amen.